invitation to speak today. As you said, I did most of my work with coronaviruses, but as I've transitioned to a more clinical role, the patients I see most uh, suffering the most morbidity and mortality from acute respiratory viral infections are immunocompromised hosts. And so that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit today. We've had a lot of background on the RNA viruses that cause these respiratory viral infections, and I'd just like to remake that point that this is a very diverse group of viruses. We have coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, enteroviruses, parainfluenza, influenza, um, and as well as some DNA, uh, the adenovirus and bocavirus, which I won't be talking about very much today, just because I'm biased. I like the RNA viruses. Additionally, they have, in addition to the diversity, they have a very rapidity with which they can escape neutralization. It makes them a, a difficult therapeutic target. Over the past 15 to 20 years, we've had a massive improvement in our clinical ability to diagnose these viruses. We've gone from viral shell cultures in the lab to um, multiplex PCRs that can give us 20 answers for whether or not it's one of 20 different viruses in under one to two hours, which has magnificently approved, improved our ability to recognize respiratory viral infections in adult, adults suffering from these uh, infections, but we haven't advanced our therapeutics to match the advances in diagnostics. The immunocompromised hosts I wanted to talk about today um, come from a bunch of different uh, backgrounds. We have our hematologic malignancies like leukemias, lymphomas, patients who are receiving chemotherapeutics for solid malignancies. What brings these all together is they're all receiving um, antibody they're receiving chemotherapeutics like tacrolimus <coughs> and mycophenolate as well as steroids. Tacrolimus serves as a calcineurin inhibitor which will inhibit your lymphocytes. Mycophenolate inhibits purine synthesis, similarly inhibits lymphocyte function. And then our hem hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients as well as our solid organ transplants, particularly our lung transplant patients almost universally receive lymphocyte-depleting antibodies, such as thymoglobulin, which is a polyclonal T-cell, anti-T-cell antibody mix, as well as almtuzumab, also known as CAMPATH, which is a monoclonal antibody targeting CD52, which will significantly de deplete your lymphocyte. So what you note that's in common with all of these hosts is they all have a depletion of their lymphocytes, which is associated with a more persistent and a progression of your respiratory viral infections. When you look at the hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients, if you, you'll see a lot of different studies done at many different institutions looking at the incidence of these respiratory viral infections in these patients. These are patients who have had their bone marrow ablated so that they can be replaced by stem cell transplant to, transplant to cure usually hematologic malignancies. It's a very small graph from just one study, but you see that the incidence of a respiratory viral infection, anyone that was diagnosed, over the course of 60 months approached 50% of these patients. Another study out of Seattle, again using a multiplex PCR, single center study saw for approximately 40% of their patients suffered a respiratory viral infection. When they break it down by subtype, you see coronaviruses and rhinoviruses most prevalently, followed closely by what one group called flu-like viruses. These are human metanumavirus, parainfluenza virus, influenza itself, because these tend to cause slightly more uh, significant morbidity and mortality than corona and rhinoviruses. Another group saw a very similar breakdown when they looked prospectively at their patients. They saw rhinovirus, coronavirus, RSV, PIV, adenovirus, flu, and human metanumavirus. So we have a very high incidence of respiratory viral infections in these patients and a, a, group, a very diverse set of pathogens causing these infections. I mentioned that also transplant patients have a, a sig significant respiratory tract infection. One group looked prospectively at all of their lung transplant patients over one year of follow-up. They s prospectively monitored nasopharyngeal swabs by PCR, the ones that are very difficult to collect because they feel terrible. Um, they monitored them at every month following transplant up to a year out. 52% of these, again, developed a respiratory tract infection. And when they sampled more invasively in some of these patients, because these patients do get frequent bronchoscopies, which is more invasive tests, a full 38% of the, or 34%, uh, had lower respiratory tract infection with respiratory viruses. When they broke them down to try and figure out do these respiratory viral infections have any significant morbidity or mortality effects in these patients, this group of lung transplant patients didn't suffer death from these infections, nor did they lose their lung transplants, as it were. But what they did suffer is a kind of chronic rejection, which is a decline in your ability to, to exchange air effectively. And in our lung transplant patients, it's basically how long is this lung going to last you? Basically, is the lung declining in function? And they associated this significant decline with coronavirus infections in particular. 
So we have a very high incidence of infections, and we have a significant outcome, in a, in, at least in transplant patients. What you'll also notice in a lot of these patients, the virus will persist for a long time. Because these patients are significantly immunosuppressed, they do not clear their infection. This is one study that looked as far out as 12 weeks post-transplant, where these rhinoviruses and coronaviruses were persistent. They made note that in that first week when they first started sampling, they weren't, not all of the patients were susceptible, or they were not symptomatic with their rhinovirus or their coronavirus. But the patients who had persistent infection at five, six, and 12 weeks, all of them had become symptomatic by that point. And it leads into the concern that these patients who are persistently infection will become symptomatic, and then the fearful result is that they would then progress to have a lower respiratory tract infection, a pneumonia, and suffer worsening morbidities and mortalities from that. Our thought from a viral perspective is that if these viruses are persistently infecting the host, are they going to undergo evolution to more adapt to, their, uh, to the human host or to the lower respiratory tract and to cause a more severe disease? One study looked at five of their patients who had persistent lower respiratory tract infections with coronaviruses. Two of the patients showed no changes over the course of around 20 weeks of infection. Three did show some genomic changes, but nothing that was very drastic, nothing that was an increased rate from the basal rate of change that's seen in coronaviruses. But these are viruses that are not under selection. So if we go on to develop therapeutics for these respiratory viral infections, we might need to be a little bit concerned that we might be selecting for resistance very easily if we, we don't have a host immune response to help clear this infection. So the big concern, as I mentioned, is this progression from an upper respiratory tract infection or a plain old common cold to a lower respiratory tract infection or a pneumonia. We don't see it very commonly in healthy adults. They don't progress to pneumonia unless it's a severe flu. But these hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients, these transplant patients, these cancer patients will often progress. So one group saw that in their hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients, a full third to half of the patients who developed an upper respiratory tract infection went on to develop a pneumonia from it. And this progression was more likely to occur in their patients who had severe lymphopenia or a cell count below 52% versus those that had or a cell count below 200 white cells per microliter compared to those who had more than 200. So 52% with those with severe lymphopenia went on to develop pneumonia. Only 30% of those without it went on to develop pneumonia. And this may even be an underestimate because as I said, the diagnostics to, do, to identify a lower respiratory tract infection is a bronchoscopy, which is a somewhat very slightly risky but definitely more uncomfortable procedure to have. And the mortality of these infections is not insignificant. One study looked at RSV and hemometanumavirus looking for their hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients. 43% of these patients died within 60 days of this infection, 60 to 90 days, 43%. When you break it down by other viruses, influenza has mortality rates ranging from 6 to 25 percent, RSV anywhere from 29 to 88 percent, metanumavirus up to 43 percent, parainfluenza up to 35 percent, rhinovirus up to 80 percent, and coronaviruses have a slightly lower risk of mortality right now. But then again, it wasn't incorporated into our multiplex PCRs until just in the past five years, so I think we're going to see more and more coronaviruses included in these studies. We have many therapeutic targets for all of these respiratory viruses. The most commonly used that's, that I see is IVIG or immunoglobulin, a polyclonal in, uh, immunoglobulin that can be used off-label for RSV. At least in adults, it is approved for children. Um, and flu IVIG, which is an enhanced flu immunoglobulin that can be used for influenza. The efficacy is not great for a lot of these, however. There's some new TLR agonists that are in development, one which includes TLR9 and a TLR26 agonist in combination to kind of enhance the immune system to kind of create a broad spectrum anti-infectious agent. It's, it should be targeting viruses and bacteria, but their concern is that there might be some increased immu immune mediated pathology with this therapeutic. As we've seen, we have multiple receptor binding therapeutics, the, hem the hemagglutinin and monoclonals for influenza that are at least in phase two trials so far as I know hemagglutinin and neuraminidase inhibitors for parainfluenza virus that are in preclinical studies. We have fusion treatment options, including DS-181 for parainfluenza, Presetivir for RSV, that are in both of which are in phase two trials, as well as some other studies, and some preclinical work suggesting DAS-181 may be useful for human metanumavirus. 
We have the approved neuraminidase inhibitors, osotamavir, paramavir, and zanamavir for influenza, and the M2 inhibitors such as amantadine for influenza A that's unfortunately made obsolete by resistance. Nucleoside analogs are promising. Ribavirin has been used off-label for years for RSV, as well as in, in some institutions for metanumavirus and parainfluenza virus. We've heard about favipiravir or T705, which should have some broad spectrum activity against multiple RNA viruses, but is certainly being uh, advanced at least through phase three trials in the US, and is, uh, I believe is approved for pandemic flu in Japan already. We also have lumicidine and remdesivir um, targeting coronaviruses, parainfluenza virus, metanumavirus, and RSV. Uh, additional interest, intracellular targets include the small interferon RNAs targeting RSV and the recently approved baloxivir, which is a cap-dependent endonucleus inhibitor that was approved in the U.S. for uh, healthy, otherwise healthy or uncomplicated influenza infections. And then there are the capsid inhibitors that we heard about as well, such as Piconeril for RSV and Vipinavir for RSV. You'll note that of all of these options and all of these targets, only influenza has approved therapeutics. And it's absolutely necessary, but there is such a broad diversity of respiratory viruses that we can be targeting that should be hopefully working their way through the development pipeline in the coming years. But because we have 20 plus years of influenza therapeutics, we can look back to this to anticipate possible pitfalls and opportunities as we develop new therapeutics. So it's worth noting that oseltamivir was initially approved for uncomplicated influenza. This is also going to be true for baloxivir, which is just approved for uncomplicated in influenza. So these are otherwise healthy adults who happen to get flu, and most of whom would probably have done quite well if they didn't get treatment. What we see clinically are the patients who have progressed and have to be hospitalized from influenza. And here is where we lack some data. You'll notice that even in the past year, we've had two studies come out that say that early use of neuraminidase inhibitor does not benefit survival. This was a group that had 500 patients, 10 of whom died, no difference in whether or not they received early neuraminidase inhibitors or not. Another study came out that said, yes, there is absolutely a benefit to early neuraminidase inhibitors in, in hospital mortality. And the difference that we're seeing is that when you have a healthy adult that can take early neuraminidase inhibitor, you prevent this progression. But as we've heard, it's often an immune-mediated progression once you hit the clinical state where you're hospitalized for your influenza. At that point, we are depending upon ventilator settings and ARDS management and ECMO in order to help these patients recover from their severe influenza. So it may be a multi-part therapeutic that we need, not both antivirals but also immune-mediated treatments to kind of help us help these patients through. I was looking for some placebo-controlled trials for neuraminidase inhibitors, and there aren't any because once this became standard of care, it's very, very, very difficult to ethically allow a patient to go on a no neuraminidase inhibitor treatment arm for any sort of new therapeutic. What there was is when they were trialing uh, paramivir, they had one arm in which patients did not get randomized to get any neuraminidase inhibitor. It was a very small arm and they actually had to end the study early because they couldn't find any controls that did not receive a neuraminidase inhibitor. But based off this small sample size, 43 in the control group and 78 in the paramivir group, so 43 who received no neuraminidase inhibitors and 78 who received paramivir, there was no difference in clinical outcomes for these hospitalized patients. So there may be a limit to our therapeutic utility for, these, for the neuraminidase inhibitors. Now, hopefully, as we develop more potent antivirals, we will see that we can achieve better outcomes. Paramivir, or veloxivir, which was just approved, has an extremely improved uh, potency, at least in, vigo, or in vitro, compared to favipiravir and oseltamivir. When you look at this clinically, you see that this is also reflected in the clearance of the viral RNA from the nasopharyngeal swabs of these healthy, otherwise healthy patients who developed influenza. So you do see an improvement in viral clearance, and hopefully this will reflect in our critically ill patients. However, this did not reflect in the clinical outcomes of this trial, which was whether or not you could advance the clearance of symptoms and shorten that duration of symptoms. And this may simply be due to the fact that there's a practical limit on how rapidly symptom resolution can occur in an otherwise healthy patient. However, in our patients who've already progressed and may be hospitalized from this, or in our immunocompromised patients who wouldn't clear this otherwise. These are the patients where I would anticipate veloxivir to have an incredible clinical impact 
Unfortunately, this was approved without having enrolled a clinical trial yet for immunocompromised patients. So they're trying to enroll a clinical trial right now, but I anticipate some difficulty as we find that this becomes standard of care and we can't enroll fully and get the data that we would like. It's also worth noting that in this clinical trial of otherwise healthy adults, approximately 11% of these patients developed substitutions that are associated with re reduced susceptibility to baloxivir while on treatment. So they cleared the virus very rapidly, but a full 10% of them did not have escape substitutions before treatment and did after treatment, which suggests that we may need combination therapies, even with our more potent antivirals, in order to prevent escape and resistance, particularly as a lot of these viruses in immunocompromised patients are going to have persistent disease for months. So in summary, our immunocompromised patients are an incredible target for us for our antivirals. They have very significant risk factors for complicated respiratory viral infections. A full 40 to 50% of them are going to develop a respiratory viral infection. Of those, a full 30 to 50% will progress to develop pneumonia. And the mortality associated with this, although we have many different single center studies, the mortality is dramatic. So while our diagnostics have improved and we have some improvement in our therapeutics, a lot of these you'll notice are still in preclinical phase one, phase two trials, and we have a lot of room to grow. What I'd like to see is when we hit those phase three trials, when we can start testing efficacy in clinically relevant populations, that we identify the cl clinically relevant population that is our immunocompromised hosts. Because these are the ones where I think we'll see better results and we can have the most clinical impact. And then looking back at influenza, you can anticipate that there might be some limitations to our therapeutic efficacy once these patients are critically ill and in the hospital. So there may need to be a role for immunomodulatory therapeutics. And there is always the concern for selection for resistance, so we may need combination therapeutics. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my mentors at the Institute of Human Virology, the Center for Vaccine Development, and the University of Maryland. Thank you.